The Introduction, page 5. A single knoll rises out of the plain in Oklahoma, north and west of the Wichita Range. For my people, the Kiowas, it is an old landmark, and they give it the name Rainy Mountain. The hardest weather in the world is there. Winter brings blizzards, hot, tornadic winds arise in the spring, and in the summer the prairie is an anvil's edge. The grass turns brittle and brown, and it cracks beneath your feet. There are green belts along the rivers and creeks, linear groves of hickory and pecan, willow and witch hazel. At a distance in July or August, the steaming foliage seems almost to writhe in fire. Great green and yellow grasshoppers are everywhere in the tall grass, popping up like corn to sting the flesh, and tortoises crawl about on the red earth, going nowhere in the plenty of time. Loneliness is an aspect of the land. All things in the plain are isolated. There is no confusion of objects in the eye, but one hill, or one tree, or one man. To look upon that landscape in the early morning, with the sun at your back, is to lose the sense of proportion. Your imagination comes to life, and this, you think, is where creation was begun. I returned to Rainy Mountain in July. My grandmother had died in the spring, and I wanted to be at her grave. She had lived to be very old, and at last infirm. Her only living daughter was with her when she died, and I was told that in death her face was that of a child. I like to think of her as a child. When she was born, the Kiowas were living the last great moment of their history. For more than a hundred years they had controlled the open range from the Smoky Hill River to the Red, from the headwaters of the Canadian to the Fork of the Arkansas and Cimarron. In alliance with the Comanches they had ruled the whole of the Southern Plains. War was their sacred business, and they were among the finest horsemen the world has ever known. But warfare for the Kiowas was preeminently a matter of disposition, rather than of survival, and they never understood the grim, unrelenting advance of the U.S. cavalry. When at last, divided and ill-provisioned, they were driven onto the staked plains in the cold rains of autumn, they fell into panic. In Palo Juro Canyon, they abandoned their crucial stores to pillage, and had nothing then but their lives. In order to save themselves, they surrendered to the soldiers at Fort Sill and were imprisoned in the old stone corral that now stands as a military museum. My grandfather was spared, my grandmother was spared the humiliation of those high gray walls by eight or ten years, but she must have known from birth the affliction of defeat, the dark brooding of old warriors. Her name was Aho and she belonged to the last culture to arrive in North America. Her forebears came down from high country in western Montana nearly three centuries ago. They were a mountain people, a mysterious tribe of hunters whose language has never been positively classified in any major group. In the late seventeenth century, they began a long migration to the south and east. It was a journey toward the dawn, and it led to a golden age. Along the way, the Kiowas were refriended by the Crows, which gave them the culture and religion of the plains. They acquired horses, and their ancient nomadic spirit was suddenly free of the ground. They acquired Taime, the sacred Sundance doll. From that moment, the object and symbol of their worship, and so shared in the divinity of the sun. Not least, they acquired the sense of destiny, therefore courage and pride. When they entered upon the southern plains, they had been transformed. No longer were they slaves to the simple necessity of survival. They were a lordly and dangerous society of fighters and thieves, hunters and priests of the sun. According to their origin myth, they entered the world through a hollow log. From one point of view, their migration was the fruit of an old prophecy, for indeed they had emerged from a sunless world. Although my grandmother lived out her long life in the shadow of Rainy Mountain, the immense landscape of the continental interior lay like memory in her blood. 
she could tell of the crows whom she had never seen and of the black hills where she had never been i wanted to see in reality what she had seen more perfectly in the mind's eye and travelled fifteen hundred miles to bring my pilgrimage to begin my pilgrimage yellowstone it seemed to me was the top of the world a region of deep lakes and dark timber canyons and waterfalls but beautiful as it is one might have the sense of confinement there the skyline in all directions is close at hand the high wall of the woods and deep cleavages of shade there is a perfect freedom in the mountains but it belongs to the eagle and the elk the badger and the bear the kiowas reckoned their statue by the distance they could see and they were bent and blind in the wilderness descending eastward the highland meadows are a stairway to the plain in july the inland slope of the rockies is luxuriant with flax and buckwheat stone crop and larkspur the earth unfolds and the limit of the land recedes clusters of trees and animals grazing far in the distance cause the vision to reach away and wonder to build upon the mine the sun follows a longer course in the day and the sky is immense beyond all comparison the great billowing clouds that sail upon it are shadows that move upon the grain like water dividing light farther down in the land of the crows and blackfeet the plain is yellow sweet clover takes hold of the hills and bends upon itself to cover and seal the soil there the kiowas paused on their way they had come to the place where they must change their lives the sun is at home on the plains precisely there does it have certain character of a god when the kiowas came to the land of the crows they could see the dark leaves of the hill and as dawn crawled across the big hidden river the profusion of light on the grain shelves the oldest deity ranging after the solstices not yet would they veer southward to the cauldron of the land that lay below they must wean their blood from the northern winter and hold the mountains a while longer in their view they bore time in procession to the east a dark mist lay over the black hills and the land was like iron at the top of a ridge i caught sight of devil's tower up thrust against the gray sky as if in the birth of time the core of the earth had begun through its crust and the motion of the world was begun there are things in nature that engender an awful quiet in the heart of man devil's tower is one of them two centuries ago because they could not do otherwise the kiowas made a legend at the base of the rock my grandmother said eight children were there at play seven sisters and their brother suddenly the boy was struck dumb he trembled and began to run upon his hands and feet his fingers became claws and his body was covered with fur directly there was a bear where the boy had been the sisters were terrified they ran and the bear after them they came to the stump of a great tree and the tree spoke to them it bade them climb upon it and as they did so it began to rise into the air the bear came to kill them but they were just beyond its reach it reared against the tree and scored the bark all around with its claws the seven sisters were born into the sky and they became the stars of the big dipper from that moment on and so long as the legend lives the kiowas have kinsmen in the night sky whatever they were in the mountains they could be no more however tenuous their well-being however much they had suffered and would suffer again they had found a way out of the wilderness my mother had a reference for the sun a holy regard that now is all but gone out of mankind there was a wariness in her and an ancient awe she was a christian in her later years but she had come a long way about and she never forgot her birthright as a child she had been to the sun dances she had taken part in those annual rites and by them she had learned the restoration of her people in the presence of taime she was about seven when the last kiowa sun dance was held in eighteen eighty seven on the washita river above rainy mountain creek the buffalo were gone in order to consummate the ancient sacrifice 
to impale the head of a buffalo bull upon the medicine tree, a delegation of old men journey into Texas, there to beg and barter for an animal for the good night herd. She was ten when the Kiowas came together for the last time as a living Sundance culture. They could find no buffalo. They had to hang an old hide from the sacred tree. Before the dance could begin, a company of soldiers rode out from Fort Sill under orders to disperse the tribe. Forbidden without cause, the essential act of their faith, having seen the wild herd slaughtered and left to rot upon the ground, the Kiowas backed away forever from the medicine tree. That was July twentieth, 1890, at the Great Bend of the Washita. My grandmother was there. Without bitterness, and for as long as she lived, she bore a vision of deicide. Now that I can have her only in memory, I see my grandmother in the several postures that were peculiar to her, standing at the wood stove on a winter morning and turning meat in a great iron skillet, sitting at the south window bent above her beadwork, and afterwards when her vision failed looking down for a long time into the fold of her hands going out upon a cane very slowly as she did when the weight of age came upon her praying i remember her most often at prayer she made long rambling prayers out of suffering and hope having seen many things i was never sure that i had the right to hear so exclusive were they of all mere custom and company the last time I saw her, she prayed, standing by the side of her bed at night, naked to the waist, the light of a kerosene lamp moving upon her dark skin. Her long black hair, always drawn and braided in the day, lay upon her shoulders and against her breasts like a shawl. I do not speak Kiowa, and I never understood her prayers, but there was something inherently sad in the sound, some mere hesitation upon the syllables of sorrow. She began in a high and descending pitch, exhausting her breath to silence. Then again and again, and always the same intensity of effort, of something that is and is not, like urgency in the human voice. Transported so in the dancing light among the shadows of her room, she seemed beyond the reach of time. But that was illusion. I think I knew then that I should not see her again. Houses are like sentinels in the plain, old keepers of the weather watch. There, in a very little while, wood takes on the appearance of great age. All colors wear soon away in the wind and rain, and the wood is burned gray, and the grain appears, and the nails turn red with rust. The window panes are black and opaque. You imagine there is nothing within, and indeed there are many ghosts, bones given up to the land. They stand here and there against the sky, and you approach them for a longer time than you expect. They belong in the distance. It is their domain. Once there was a lot of sound in my grandmother's house, a lot of coming and going, feasting and talk. The summers there were full of excitement and reunion. The Kiowas are a summer people. They abide the cold and keep to themselves, but when the season turns and the land becomes warm and vital, they cannot hold still. An old love of going returns upon them. The aged visitors who come to see my grandmother's house when I was a child were made of lean and leather, and they bore themselves upright. They wore great black hats and bright ample shirts that shook in the wind. They rubbed fat upon their hair and wound their braids with strips of colored cloth. Some of them painted their faces and carried the scars of old and cherished enmities. They were an old council of warlords, come to remind and be reminded of who they were. Their wives and daughters served them well. The women might indulge themselves, gossip, was at once the mark and compensation of their servitude. They made loud and elaborate talk among themselves, full of jest and gesture, fright and false alarm. They went abroad in fringed and large shawls, bright beadwork and German silver. They were at home in the kitchen, and they prepared meals that were banquets.